Thank you for joining us. If you don't know me, I'm Pastor Brad. It's a joy to have you with us this morning. One of the things we do each week when we gather is to worship in a variety of ways. We worship through song, we worship through prayer, we worship through scripture reading, we worship through our giving. And now we're going to spend a a period of time worshiping through the word or worshiping through the teaching of scripture. And what we've been doing for the last month, month and a half years, we've started a journey through the New Testament book of Colossians. And uh, we're, we're t- we took all of April, we're into May, and we're going to keep plugging through until the end of June to get through this, uh, this, this book. It's a relatively short book. It's only four chapters long. It was written by the Apostle Paul to early Christians in the uh, area of Colossae. And he wanted them to know, how do you live this Jesus-centered life? Because again, for them, like we've noted a few weeks already, when he was writing this book to the Colossians, they didn't have a Bible. They had the the Old Testament, which was, that's the Bible, but it didn't have any of the accounts of Jesus or what Jesus said or what Jesus' coming meant now that he had come and the implications of that. So Paul was writing to say, hey, I saw Jesus. I talked with him. Here's what the other apostles, when they were with him and when the disciples were walking alongside of him before his death, burial, and resurrection. And he's like, I need you to know who Jesus is and what to do as a result. And so what we've done is we've walked through kind of what Paul was walking these early first Christians through. And you have to remember, and this is tough for us, this was a letter. Okay, This wasn't a theological textbook he was writing. He was writing to these these believers of Colossae saying, hey, I need you to know this. I've I've heard about stuff going on. I'm going to be there at at some point. But in the meantime, I want you to know this. So what we do is we take a couple of verses from a chapter each week, and we talk about it for 35, 45, 50 minutes, you know, and and just kind of dig into it. That's not how this book would have been read almost 2,000 years ago. What would have happened is someone would have come with the letter and would have said, ah, Paul gave this to me, and he wants, he, he wants you to know it. So that everyone would kind of sit down, and that person would open this up and just read it from beginning to end. And then most times they, there might be discussion afterwards. They say, oh, can you read it again? And that was how it was consumed. So I would encourage you, if you're, if you're part of our church family and you haven't done this yet, I would really encourage you, Take the time over this next week or so to read through this whole book in one fell swoop. It might take you 15, 20, 30 minutes. It all depends how fast of a reader. But that's how this book was written because it was a letter. And it kind of all builds on it. So we're going to do a little bit of review to catch us up for where we're going to go. Because like I said, these believers didn't have the Gospels. They, they, they didn't have those first four books of our New Testament and our Bibles today, which told the story of who Jesus was. So he begins chapter one, and he's really talking about the amazing supremacy of Jesus, that Jesus is preeminent. He is supreme. He's of first order. He is not only the son of God, he is very God of very God. And he said that that must impact our view of him, of the world, and it should then change what we do. And that's where we went in week two, where we talked kind of for the last part of chapter one and the beginning of chapter two of walking in a manner worthy of this Jesus who is supreme. And then we said, the reason we can do that is that this Jesus who's supreme has given us new life and that we can live as a result of the life that he pours into us. And that means if he's done that, The reason that we can stand before Jesus at all, before the divine author of creation and all his holiness and perfection, is the fact that he has qualified us. We don't have to earn this. We don't have to try to be good enough so God will love us and accept us and and welcome us into his family. Because of what Jesus did and what he offers to us, God looks at us and he sees the goodness of Jesus. He doesn't see our dirty, rotten nastiness that we go through. He sees the perfection of Jesus. And that's why we're qualified. And then we said that just like Jesus rose from the dead, 
we too can be raised to new life. That's where we went last week, raised to new life in Jesus. And if that's the case, then our perspective needs to change. And we need to begin setting our minds on things above rather than on things below. If we've been raised with Christ, then our minds need to be set on things above. And this was not a spatial thing. This wasn't geometry. Like, this thing is above, like literally in this geographic space above, but it is this idea that this is where the presence of God is. And our minds, our perspectives need to be focused on where the presence of God manifests. Now, this week, we're going to look at something different. Uh, it flows out of it, but it's a little different perspective because we've talked about the preeminence of Christ. We've walked about what it means to walk worthy of Christ, of being alive in Christ, of being qualified in Christ, of being raised in Christ. All of this about Jesus. We're going to talk about what Jesus kills this week. Okay? And this is one of those where in the past I've, I've shown a PG-13 warning. Okay? I don't know if you've been with us for a while. You've seen me. I flashed that up a few times. So if there are young ears in here, I don't think we have too many at the moment, that you don't want me uh, to, or you don't want them to hear from me about where the genesis of our progeny comes from. This is time to walk them out of the room so that you can have that discussion on your own. Or if you're listening online, this is your warning to maybe have them, you know, stream something else for a minute while you're listening here. Because we are going to talk about some stuff, and we're going to talk pretty frankly about some stuff that deals with that area. So I think I've filibustered long enough for anyone who's in that category to have removed said persons. But I want to start with a quote from an author that I love, someone who has been very influential on my personal life and my, my personal theology, and that's a guy by the name of N.T. Wright. N.T. Wright is a uh, prolific author. I'm pretty sure he has written more books in his life than I have read in my life. This man is amazing. He's an academic. He's a pastor. Uh, he's a bishop. He's been connected with the Anglican Church for a super long time and in leadership. And in uh, one of his commentaries and studies on Colossians, on the section we're at, this is what he writes. He says, there are certain patterns of behavior which are the common coin of the world that remains ignorant of the God revealed in Jesus. These must be taken off like a suit of clothes that's inappropriate for the new occasion, like a ski suit at a birthday party. And he, he likened this in, this in this book that he wrote. Um, and, and the book was called Paul for Everyone, talking about the Apostle Paul when it comes to Colossians. He's trying to make Paul relatable in our common vernacular. But he was saying he had gone skiing with his daughter up in the mountains, like snow skiing. And so they had kind of finished it up. They got to the bottom of the hill, and he got a call from his wife, I think it was, and she said, where are you? And he said, what are you talking about? The party started 10 minutes ago. He had forgotten that they were going to this birthday party for some family uh, connection, but it was like a formal event. But for where they were, they, they were, the location was like between, so they couldn't go back home they had to go right to the party, so they showed up to this formal birthday party, you know, people all dressed to the nines, and they're wearing their puffy and wet ski, uh, ski suits, right? So the setting, what they were wearing wasn't right. So they, they, they needed to take that off to be in the setting in an appropriate way, and that's what Paul is saying here about for those who are in Christ, we can't wear the same stuff that we wore before we were in Christ. And we have to take that stuff off. And what we're going to see here in Colossians is we actually need to kill that stuff. So here's kind of a, a, a thought that is going to kind of set the stage based on what, what N.T. Wright here has already summarized. And that is Christianity's rules, the things that, that it asks us to do, are not a way to secure God's favor but it's a grateful response to having already been graciously given it. That is the absolute linchpin for us to understand the difference between Christianity and virtually every other major world religion. The difference for Christianity is we do not do, if we are following Jesus, we are not doing anything to try to earn God's favor. We are not doing anything to try to get into heaven. We're not doing 
anything to make ourselves good enough or worthy enough so that somehow God might let us in. Virtually every other religion, that's the system. You've got to do enough good to please God or placate God just enough so that you can cross the threshold and get in. For Christianity, the truth is, God says, I put my goodness on you. I offer it to you and, and allow you to take it at no cost. But when that's done, at no cost to us, because the full cost was paid by Jesus. That's the whole thing of Easter. That's why we got a cross on the back wall here. It points us back to what Jesus did. But that difference is that if we've accepted that, that changes how we act, not to get in, but as a grateful response to already being there. Can you think of those situations in your life where people have just been kind and gracious to you and that changes how you react, that, that produces a sense of gratitude? I think it's a pretty common, pretty common scenario for us. But that's what Christianity does. It changes the whole religious perspective. And that's why Christianity was so revolutionary in the first century. You see, being a Jesus follower doesn't happen by accident. You have to choose the gift that's given. But once it's been given, you, you couldn't earn it, but it does require effort to then follow after, to come after Jesus. Jesus says, if anyone would come after me, let him de deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. So he's saying, you're allowed to be with me. I'm inviting you to just, you're with me. You don't have to earn it. Just come. But if you do, then you actually have to start showing the gratitude for it by becoming more and more like Jesus. So while it's all on the merit of Jesus, all on the work of Jesus, if it's authentic, if you, if I, if we are truly followers of Jesus, then there will be a proportionate response to that gospel, to that good news. It will change how I act. I will not be perfect. You will not be perfect. We're going to mess it up. But there, that, that arc of our lives will begin bending towards looking more and more like Jesus. Well, N.T. Wright goes on in, in talking about this passage that we're going to get to in just a few moments in Colossians, and he says this, there are two main areas of behavior that Paul lists as typical of the old lifestyle that is now to be abandoned. Remember that whole thing about Jesus supreme and we need to be raised with him. We've been raised with him. And what does that mean? Well, there's things that need to be abandoned. They have to do with two things, sex on the one hand and speech on the other. These are two central areas of human life, both involving great potential for good and also for evil. This is one of the travesties, honestly, uh, uh, of the church today. And that is, when I said the word sex, there was a visible from up here, because I can see y'all, okay? There was, oh, what? Like, there was a, a physical response. Can that guy say that inside a church? Here's the thing. We have taken sex that is a good and beautiful and wonderful thing, and we have made it something to be ashamed of. I thought, growing up, and this was no one person's specific you know, fault, but growing up in the church, I thought sex was dirty and gross and wrong. Now, I still wanted to do it, you know, <laughs> but it was, there was something wrong with it. And this is something we have to change because there are maladaptions to sex, meaning we can screw up, mess up, and do wrong what God designed this to be, but we really have to stop making people feel icky about something God designed to be in perfection. It was part of the Garden of Eden, okay? So we have to destigmatize that, and quite frankly, one of the things that we say, kind of a, a value in our church, something we try to wrap our arms around, is that this place, us gathering together, big groups, small groups, whatever, this has to be the safest place to talk about any topic. It has to be. So that's why we're going to do it. We've also said that we believe that God's absolutes are absolutely good, so we're going to talk about it, we're going to preach it, we're going to do our best to live it. 
So we're going to do it now, and this is going to be a little bit of a flyover. Because like I've been hinting at, when we come to the fall, we're going to be hitting some uh, interesting topics. I think I've told you, we're tentatively calling it, uh, we don't talk about that. Talking about stuff that we don't talk about in church, right? We're going to talk about, and this could be one of those. We're going to talk about sexual ethics uh, this fall as part of that series. But he's saying these issues of both sex and speech, okay, that those are two massive areas that can be used for either good or evil. So the choice is, what are we going to do? Well, let's look at Let's look at what Colossians says, what Paul is saying in Colossians. If you've got your Bibles, please open them to chapter 3. And you can use your, your digital devices, you can use your paper Bibles. If you don't have one, there should be a Bible in the, uh, underneath the chairs in front of you. And we're going to turn to chapter 3. We're going to go through just, again, a handful of, uh, handful of verses. We're going to start in verse 5. And in verse 5, we read this. Put to death. This word death in the original Greek, the language that the majority of the New Testament was written in is nekru. It's where we get our English word necrotic or necrosis. It's the, the, the action, the process of something dying. So the idea is here to put to death. It's not like, you know, take it out back and just shoot it. Like, and it, now it's dead. The idea is also subdue. Because quite frankly, this side of heaven, you're never going to get to a point where you have had such total victory over sin that you don't have to deal with it anymore. Eh, I'm done. I took care of that. So that's why this word, we have to understand, yes, it is put to death. It is the process of killing, but it's not one where you're ever going to say, I did it. I took it out back and shot it, and it's, we're good. We're done. <laughs> this is going to be something you have to continually make sure that you have taken captive that you've made it submissive, you've subdued it to the will of God. So what is this? Put to death, therefore, whatever is earthly in you. And hopefully that word earthly is ringing some bells because it's a very similar word to what we looked at last week in chapter chapter 3, but verse 2, where Paul said, set your minds on the things that are above, on the, the domain, the dominion, the presence of God, and not on things that are on the earth, those things that are separated from his presence, those things that are not of his manifest uh, reality about us. You are to set your minds on that, not on this. Now, not only are you supposed to set your mind on the things above rather than down here, you are to put to death, you are to subdue all these earthly things. Now, that doesn't mean, like we said last week, that, you know, we're just these holy saint people that, well, we don't do anything with the world because it is below us and we are holy, right? That's not what we're saying. What we're saying is those systems don't have authority in our life anymore. Those things, those values that are opposed to the values of our divine Savior, we say, nope, you submit to him. And now that's what we're, we're, we're talking about. He really highlights two areas. The first one is right here. It's kind of the capstone. It's sexual immorality. And it's interesting because as you've gone through the understanding of some of these terms over the history of the Christian church, so 2,000 years of history, really, for the first 1,950 of those or so, This term was very clearly universally understood. It is only in the last 50 years or so that we've begun to say, now does it really mean that? And the scary thing is, can you think of another character in the Bible who said something very similar to that? Go back to the garden. Did God really say that? That's what we're doing here. This word, sexual immorality, We've tried to say it's these very narrowly defined this thing over there in order to justify activity that we're engaging in that is not pleasing to God, which does not fit within his divine order and structure. The the, the term here that that is translated sexual immorality is the term pornea. And this is, it's where we get our, our English word pornography. And it is used for anything sexual. Listen to this. Anything sexual outside the confines of biblically sanctioned marriage, before, during, after. The whole idea is it's not just uh, penetrative uh, intercourse, 
which some people try to say, well, that's what it means, so that's why it's okay if you do X, Y, or Z. No, 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 no. This, is, this term is broad for anything, any sexual content at all that does not fit in the biblical standard for marriage. That is what this term means. For nearly two millennia, the, the church just so universally understood it, this never needed to be defined in a, in a uh, message or in a church service, a church context. It's only in the last 50 years or so that we've had to go back and say, wait, 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 no, no, no. You can't say, well, we didn't go all the way, so, you know, it's still okay. Or we only did it occasionally, so it's okay, you know. Or, hey, we're committed to one another, so it's okay. No, no, no. It has to be within these boundaries. That's what, this, this is what Paul is saying. That must be subdued. You must wrestle it to the ground. And I will say, I think it's very interesting that he used this word here. Because of any area of sin that uh, I've experienced in my life, that I've walked through with other people and theirs, the one that seems to fight and scratch and claw its way back into so many people's lives are issues of pornea, of sexual immorality, of sexually based sins. And in fact, in the book of 1 Corinthians, Paul's talking about this stuff, and he says that everyone who sins sexually sins against his own body. He says every other sin is outside the body, but he who sins sexually sins against himself, sins internally. And we're not exactly sure what that means, other than he sets this like, kind of category of sin saying it has some kind of special significance. And I'll tell you, I see it cropping up in people's lives again and again and again. And then Paul goes on here and he kind of defines it. He gives some examples. Now, what he's not doing, what we like, in the Western world, we like lists. Who here is a, is a list maker? Mm -hmm. You list maker shot your hand up. I mean, you are proud of your lists. We like, oh, it's neatly defined. It's this, this, this. Okay, it's not that, so anything not on the list is okay, right? Okay, that's not what Paul's doing. He's giving examples. He's giving categories. And he kind of bookends it, we'll see here, between sexual immorality and then this term idolatry at the end of the verse, just giving this whole sense of this area that he's talking about. But one example of earthly, and that's sexual immorality. Well, this next term is impurity, and it's uh, akatharsia. And it's, this is a, a cultic word. This is a religious word. This is, he's talking about those people who would somehow use sexuality or allow sexuality to enter into religious practices. If you remember, I mentioned... Uh, it was the last week or the week before, the, the church that tried to redeem pole dancing. Remember that? That they said, oh, hey, we're pole dancing to worship music, so it's Jesus-y now. But no, 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 you can't do that. It's kind of like that, but at, in the day, there were literal cults that used sexual activity within the confines of their religious activity. It was part of their worship. And you'll find that today, that there are cults, there are, um, there are some expressions of paganism and things like that, which include sexual activity as part of their philosophy or religious structures. It is literally still going on today. But it's this idea of doing, bringing impurity, things that kind of stain it. And on some level, it might even be like, well, this is the stuff that's not that bad. Like, well, yeah, I can see, you know, like, pornea, and that's where, they would have understood pornea as, like, anything sexual. These are those things that are, like, quasi-sexual. Like, they're just kind of, like, right alongside, you know, trying to make those excuses. And he's saying, no, even those things that are impure, this is earthly. And then he goes to this word passion. And you have to understand, this passion, the way they use passion, especially the New Testament, is very different than how we tend to. Like, if I say, oh, I'm passionate for my wife. We're celebrating 17 years of passion, right? We go, we would consider that a virtue, right? You should be, you should be passionate about your spouse. This word passion is way more in the lines of lust. And in fact, um, although you can find extra biblical accounts of this term being used, meaning outside the Bible, but Greek language of the first century world, you can find it there kind of being used more in a general sense for passion. In the Bible, 
it is never used in a positive context. It is always having to do with this idea of lust of one way or another. And see, it's not, the, it's not a desire for sex or sexual activity of the pornea, but for a selfish desire to use that for your satisfaction at the expense of another. That's one of the ways that we flip on its head this sexual order that God designed. I'm going to say it again. God designed sex for good. Literally, we see a book of the Bible which uses this picture of sexual intimacy. It's called the Song of Songs. If you were a, a, a middle school-aged boy growing up in the church, it was your favorite book in the Bible, okay? It said words that you weren't allowed to say, right? It's really cool for, for that. No, it's this idea that this picture of sexual intimacy, it, it's part of how God has made us. And it even points to our intimacy with God. Not in a weird sexual way, but this very close, intimate connection. It's not a bad thing. But what happens here is this word passion, how people will use this God-given desire, is it will become selfish. That I will, even if I'm not trying to be injurious to you with it, it means I'm going to make it about me. I'm going to take from you what I need from me. I take you out of the equation of what is supposed to be an intimate fusion of, of two committed individuals to one another, of a husband and a wife. And instead I'll say, well, I just want what I want, so give it to me. This is one of the reasons why I can confidently say that I do believe the Bible teaches that pornography, the viewing and using of pornography is absolutely wrong. Because it takes sex out of its rightful context of connection and intimacy between a husband and a wife and it makes it about selfishly fulfilling my desires. It is outside God's order. It is not a thing above. It is an earthly thing. And what am I supposed to do with the earthly things? Put them to death. We're supposed to necrosis them. We subdue them. And then we get to this idea of evil desire. And this is two words. It's kakos and epithemia. And it is literally evil, wrong, or bad, and longing. And it's, it's very, very similar, but it's, it's actually wanting to use the sex in a way that harms someone else. This is where you see, and, and unfortunately, this happens in human nature. Um, this is where rape comes into, into the picture. People who use what is supposed to be this beautiful thing, not just to get their own needs met, but to have dominance and control over others. That is not the picture of sexual intimacy. Sexual intimacy is about bringing together in union. I had the joy of officiating a wedding yesterday of a, of a kid that I knew since he was a snotty 13-year-old kid, okay? I love this guy. And he got to experience this for the first time yesterday. Him and his now wife coming together in mutual submission to one another and in beautiful, unrestrained intimacy physically, emotional, the whole kit and caboodle. It was a beautiful thing. That's what it's designed for. But it is used by some to inflict power and control over others. And then we get this last word here, which is the idea of covetousness, <coughs> which is surprising to us. It seems like that doesn't seem to fit. But the, the word here is pleonexia. And it's greediness, and it's a consuming ambition. It's the sense of wanting something that, that belongs to someone else and working, pursuing with diligence to take it for yourself, particularly by unrighteous means. You know, this is that, um, man, my buddy has a good-looking wife, that mentality. And what am I going to do about that? And inserting myself, but all for the sake of taking for me. It is I yearn for what you have. And clearly in this context, it's, it's in regard to this sexual, uh, sexual activity. It's under the umbrella of the sexual immorality. And then he says that this itself is idolatry. When we, when we don't put to death the pornea, the sexual immorality, it is literally like worshiping idols because we are saying to God, I reject your divine order, and I replace it with my own. That is what, when we don't do it God's way, 
we are, according to Paul here, we're doing the same thing as setting up a shrine to some kind of donkey statue and doing something with that. It is literally idolatry. And I'm going to tell you this not because it has any great significance, because it's just fun to say. This is a very straightforward word in the Greek. But it's idololiatria. You can say that one again at lunch? Idololiatria. You got that one? I'm going to quiz you on it later. All right. It's just a pretty cool word to say. But no, that's what happens. We engage in idol worship and idolatry when we step outside of God's established order for sexual ethics. And that's why, verse 6, on account of these, the wrath, this is the orge, the anger, this is righteous indignation. This is not just some guy who flies off the handle for no reason. Orge, this anger, this wrath, is someone has done the wrong thing, and it it incenses your, your sense of right and wrong and of justice. It's when you see, like, a big group of uh, punks beating up on some little scrawny kid, right? You get angry over that. How dare you, right? And it's this righteous anger. It's rightly directed anger. It says, on account of these, the wrath of God is coming. And then verse 7, in these you too once walked. You participated. This was your life before following Jesus when you lived in them, when you were living in them. This was part of the pre-Jesus life. This is the distinction Paul is making. Not a, well, you know, if you get around to it, this could make it a little bit better for you. He's saying, no, you used to do this. This is part of the old. This is part of the earthly. You're to set your mind on the things above. You're to put to death the things on earth. So I can say this, responding to the gospel, that means following after Jesus, means embracing a healthy sexuality. We don't have time now to fully explore all of that. There have been books and books and seminars and conferences and all that stuff for many years trying to parse this all out. And I'd be happy, if you, if you have questions about this, to, to explore it further, to give more understanding. We're going to talk about it a little bit in the fall, but this is a big topic. And in fact, it's one of the hardest things in our culture today because it's all around us. Because it's a very, very good, natural, God-given desire that is twisted in selfishness. It's one of the easiest sins to make excuses for. And it's one of the most powerful freedoms when it's embraced the God way, the Jesus way. It's not easy. It is one of the most powerful, natural drives God has created us with. And we will be because of sin, we will be naturally inclined to do it the way outside of God's standard and to fulfill our own, like we saw, selfish desires, evil desires, those passions, that covetousness, all those things to make it mine. It's going to be a huge temptation. And I can tell you, I have seen it from, I've literally seen it in elementary age uh, kids all the way up through, through people in their 90s. So you can't think, oh, that was, that's not me. That, I, I'm outside of that. You can't say, oh, I'm married. So, of course, I don't have to worry about it anymore. Nope. Let me tell you, if you're married, it's going to come in. If you haven't figured this out yet, even more once you're married than before. Because now, now our enemy really wants to mess that up. But if we're going to respond to the gospel, if we're going to do it, we have to embrace a healthy sexuality, which means we have to talk about it. This has to be one of those things that we don't go, no, that makes, we can't talk about that at church. No, this is a beautiful thing. Man has made it ugly. We need to, we need to redeem this for God. We need to redeem the conversation. But let's keep digging. We just got a couple verses left for this morning, and we're going to talk about the second thing. That was the first thing. That was talking about the issue of sex. Now we're going to talk about the issue of speech. Verse 8, but now you must put them all away. And this is really the same idea as the, the, the put to death. This is don't hold on to it. You've, you've got to put it away. You've got to secure it. You've got to imprison it for the sake of pursuing the heavenly things, the things above. And what are those things? Well, first of all, it's anger, which is interesting. This is the same word. This is um, uh, orge in the Greek. 
that said that the wrath of God was coming. It's the same word that, for wrath of God. So this is the idea of that righteous indignation, and this is one of the hardest. Some of you are probably like me, at least in this. And when someone does the wrong thing, you really, really feel the overwhelming calling to let them know their wrongness. Anybody else like that? Yep. Yeah, Norm, I saw your hand. Yep. We, I hear you. Yeah, when someone does the wrong thing, we get angry about it because it's, it's unjust. It's wrong. That's this. But what is, what, is, what is God telling us to do? He's telling you, even if you're right to be angry, put it away. Do not hold on to that. Because this is the stuff below, not the things above. You need to imprison that, capture that, make that submissive to Christ. Even though you're right to be angry. The Bible says elsewhere, we leave that in the hands of God. We leave the vengeance to the Lord, the wrath to the Lord. He alone can be trusted with it. So we have to let go, even if we're right. And then we get to this idea of wrath. And uh, uh, a lot of you know my kids, okay? They've been running around for a few years now. And our middle son in particular, man, he has got a, a personality all his own. But it's actually very, very similar to a Marvel superhero. You guys familiar with the, the Marvel superhero franchise? There's one of them who, under the right circumstances, can get really big and really green. Do you know who, what his name is? The Hulk. The Hulk, right? And we actually talk with him because he connects with this. Okay. We can't hulk out right now. That's the conversation we'll have. That's this word. This word wrath is thymos. And it is fury, intense rage. Where, where the word anger here is uh, before it is more of this like you've thought about it and it's the wrong thing and you are incised because of the wrongness of it. This word is fury. And I'll tell you, just as a side note, this is sometimes where as 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 good as our translations are, sometimes our translations make it difficult. Because just like two verses earlier, it says God's wrath, that's orge, it's translated as wrath. In this verse, that same word is translated anger, and a different word is translated wrath. So it can get confusing, I understand it, but that's why we do this, that's why we try to bring this out so that we understand the original meaning. So the first one, the anger in this verse is, I'm righteously uh, upset about what you did. I, I, I'm, I'm thinking about it, and I'm angry because of the injustice. This wrath is just that fury. It's, it's a passionate emotion. It's not reasoned, okay? That, but what he's saying here is both of those, whether it's righteous and reasoned or just overwhelming fury, you need to put it away. And when you are angry, do you tend to be quiet? Most people don't. Although, guys, if you ask your wife if she's, uh, she's angry and she just stays completely silent, she's very angry, okay? I'm just letting you know that it's not permission to do anything. You got to start looking for the things you need to apologize for. But no, so we're already, when we're angry, when we're wrathful, th this comes out verbally. And then we get to this word malice. And this is kakia. And it's actually the same root word from the evil desires in the, the verse before where that's taking these uh, desires the, and, and going about the wrong way, harmful ways in, in sexual matters. Here, it's the idea of using your words in order to harm or be injurious to someone else. Slander, it's what we know, right? It's speaking lies about someone else. But do you know what the word is here? Because it's going to be a word you recognize. It's blasphemia. That's the word here. And we use blasphemy, right, the, where we get that English word. Well, you, it's blasphemy. It's against God. Well, yes, that, that, that's the same word, but we can do that against people too. And what Paul is saying is it doesn't, it's not just when you do it against God. You can't do that against someone else where you say something about them that is not true. And I've got to tell you, just as a personal, I'm being transparent, this is one that hits your pastor a lot. Do you know how often people say things about me? That if it, I could, like, I could defend myself and I could prove wrong, 
And the Lord is really laid on my, I have to let a lot of that go because that's not what this is about. This, I, I do try to serve him and for him. But I'll tell you, this happens a lot and it hurts because our character is being called into question. Sometimes it's done unknowingly, but really this is saying, you know it's not true and you're trying to stir up trouble. Well, maybe they're a bad person. Well, could be. But doing it this way is the wrong way. It's the wrong response, even if they're wrong. This is abusive speech, saying that's which is not true about another person. And here's one that's often misused. Obscene talk from your mouth. This is astrologia, and it comes from two roots. It's two words in the Greek. It's uh, lego or lo, uh, logos, which is to speak or speaking or words, and isoskros, which is shameful or dishonest. This is using your language in a way that, it, that, that brings shame to others. It's a way of using your words literally to hurt them. Of, if I say this, I know it's going to upset you, so I say it that way. The idea is speaking in a way that causes harm. Now, I want to be careful here. What this is not is a word that says, well, here, you have to create a list of words that are dirty words that you can't say. Okay? So if you say this word that has four letters or this word that has four letters or this word that has four letters, oh, no, no, the Bible said you can't do that. No, what this is telling us, not that uh, our ethics or our morals are situational, but they are contextual. So we have to understand that in a context, saying things in a certain way can be wrong because it is offensive to that community. But that doesn't mean that in, in and of themselves, they're wrong. So I'll tell you this. Um, there will be times, do we have any handyman fix-it men? In here? Anybody, you know, work on stuff at your house? All right, Adam, yep. Now, Chris, you're not putting your hand up. You fix, like, everything. What do you... <laughs> so let's say you are driving a nail into a piece of wood, right? And you're hurrying. You've got, you've got a lot of stuff to do. And you happen to miss slightly off the nail. And with that framing hammer, decide to frame your thumb into the two-by-four, Right? Do you think your typical response for most people is, well, shoot? Is that the normal response that comes out? I would suggest no, it's not. Now, I am not advocating for certain use of certain words, but what I'm saying is what this passage is, is not talking about is if a word like that sw slips out when you smash your finger with a hammer. What this verse is talking about is saying is using your words to cause injury to someone else because you know it's offensive to them. All of this is looking at words, whether it's with your, with your anger, when it comes to truth, just whether, whether or not it's offensive to somebody, it's caring more about others with your speech than about yourself. It's how Jesus lived. It's how he's calling us to live. And then he goes on and says, don't lie. Not only don't say something that's untrue to someone, don't deceive. And that can be not even this direct untruth. It's not like me saying, oh yeah, Martin has a full head of hair. That's a lie, okay? But it would be like if Martin said, I love my full head of hair. And I don't, and he's talking to me, and I just nod at him. I didn't say it, I didn't lie to him, but I allowed him to keep believing it. I allowed him to hold on to that without saying anything in that love. Or to say just enough that is true while holding back the parts that you don't want them to know. So you didn't say something that wasn't true, but you didn't give the full truth. Guess what? That's within this ethos of lying when we're intentionally deceiving, whether by what we say directly or by what we withhold, this is what Paul is saying. This is of the earth. This is below. This is not the presence of God when you do it. And you have to put that to death. You have to put it off, the old self and the practices. Not just your identity, but what you do. It's not just saying, oh, yeah, yeah, I used to be a sinner. It's, yeah, I used to be a sinner, and I sin, 
man, I got to get rid of both. I got to stop living in the identity of who I was, but also I have to stop acting like it. And it is an ongoing. It's, again, not walk behind the shed and shoot it. Oh, we're done. Sin's taken care of. It's this is a vicious creature that I have to keep chained up. I have to constantly subdue it because it's going to try to consume me. So just like responding to the gospel means we have to embrace a healthy sexuality, responding to the gospel also means being intentionally healthy with our speech. And that's not just healthy towards ourselves. It's healthy towards others. Just like with that sexuality, it's not just healthy sexuality for me, but in my relationship towards others as well. We gotta, we gotta understand that both what and how I say matters. What I say and how I say it matters as much as what I do and how I do it. Somehow we think that those are, those are separate. Well, if I just say it, it's not that big of a word. Jesus, oh, no, no, he went back. He's like, no, 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 if you, even, if you even look lustfully at somebody, you've committed adultery in your heart. He's like, no, what happens up here matters too. You've got to take those thoughts captive to Christ. It matters how someone takes what you say as much as how you intend it. I can't tell you how many arguments I've been <laughs> with people or been trying to, to, to help mediate where that's not how I meant that is thrown out. Well, quite frankly, it don't matter how you meant it. If how it's coming out, that other person is receiving it in a hurtful, damaging, painful way. You've got to come back. You've got to let go of that. You've got to let go of your righteous indignation, right? And say, no, 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 no. I will use my words to bless rather than to curse. In fact, Proverbs 18, 20 and 21 say this. From the fruit of a man's mouth, his stomach is satisfied. He is satisfied by the yield what is produced from his lips. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruits. What we say matters. And I'm taking us here. I can say all of this. I can say all these things because just like every other week now, we can come back to this point. Each week in our series on Colossians, we've ended up saying that if Jesus is supreme, then he has authority in my life. And it's up to me whether or not I recognize it. It's like when the police officer pulls you over for, you know, driving your customary 72 and a half down Hanstown Road, okay? I've seen y'all drive, okay? So he pulls you over. He has the authority to do it. And you can say, all right, I'm going to submit to that authority. I'm going to pull over. I'm going to put my four ways on. I'm going to roll my window down, keep my hands on here, and wait for him to come up and respond to what he has to say. Or you can say, you ain't the boss of me, and floor it. You can choose to try to ignore the, the authority of the police officer, right? You can. But eventually, he will catch you. Eventually, it will catch up to you. You can try to live this life outside the authority of Jesus. It doesn't mean he's not the authority, but you're trying to live like he's not. And I can promise you that will bring pain, death, destruction, rot, and decay into your life. But the more and more we can align our lives, our decisions, our speech, our sexuality, all these areas, as if Jesus were in control, as if I'm going to do it Jesus, the Jesus way, you will start reaping the harvest of peace, of hope, of joy, of contentment, of gratitude, of fellowship, all that we designed.